Last week, we talked about the simplest way to go cruising in 2023, the easiest cruising route to the easiest cruising place with the bare minimum of hardware to have on the boat to be safe and sound while you do it. But we didn't talk about the simplest boat to do it on. So this week, we're balling on a budget and the tightest budget we can possibly do it on. Sometimes boats fall into your lap extremely cheap, but we can't rely on the mystery of the universe. So we're gonna look at stuff that's out there for sale right now. This week on Everything You Need To Know, can you go cruising, buy a boat, and outfit it for 30 grand? Some basics. Last week we said the bare minimum is a boat that can safely cross the Gulf Stream. It has a compass, a depth sounder, it carries some fresh water, and it probably tows a dinghy. We'll be using Navionics for our navigation on an iPad probably, and carrying jerry cans for fuel. So with a $30,000 budget, can you actually buy a boat, outfit it for cruising, and safely go do this thing this year? Leave in November and come back in July of 2024. Let's find out. For me, I'm gonna set a 30 foot minimum for the boat because I need it to be heavy enough to cross the Gulf Stream safely and comfortably and have room enough inside that I don't go crazy when I'm trying to live on it. Of our $30,000 budget, we're gonna try to spend less than 20,000 on the boat itself, saving 10 grand to outfit it and get it ready. So let's see what's out there. The first boat today is up in Michigan, which is actually pretty good. It's a fresh water boat and it hasn't endured decades in the salt. This is a Catalina 30 and for the 30 footers out there, these have a lot of living space in them. This one weighs about 11,000 pounds, which is kind of light, but it's also cheap. The beam is about 11 feet, so we do get a fairly spacious interior and a five foot draft that'll do us wonders when we try to get into those tight anchorages in the Bahamas. I personally love the Catalina 30. I've sailed on many of them and I have friends who own them right now. They sail extremely well for their size and they're comfortable to sleep on. The one we're looking at here already has a Dodger and a Bimini, which is a great start. And it looks to be in fairly good shape. The only downfall of these boats is the plywood on top of the keel. When Catalina put the keel on, they sandwiched a piece of marine ply between the keel and the hull and bolted it up to squish the plywood. If at some point that plywood got wet, it turns into mulch and the keel can move around ever so slightly independent of the hull. This is the boat that gave us the term Catalina Smile, a little crack in the fairing on the leading edge of the keel. This is normal on these boats and if the problem isn't too bad, it can be fixed and it is a boat that you can live with. Make sure the keel bolts are tight and if there is a Catalina Smile, grind it out and glass it again. You may have to do this every five years or so, but this boat is cheap. If this boat comes with a reasonable set of sails, the only thing we really have to worry about are soft decks, which we can fix it if the soft spots are a little bit smaller, and how well that universal diesel engine runs. It says it has about a thousand hours on it, and as a Great Lakes boat, that very well might be true. We don't use engines a lot up here. Inside this 30 footer, it feels big and open with lots of room to move around in the main saloon and a good sized galley to cook in next to a very healthy sized quarter berth to sleep in. These are easy boats to own and very capable sailors. The list on this boat is 17,000, but I see these sell for around 12 to 15 if there isn't much wrong with them. The trick to this one is you have to buy it in the summer when it's in the water because up here where we are, we haul out for the winter. Next up, another freshwater boat for you. And this one is cheap, cheap, nine grand asking price for a Tartan 30. And these things are well known on the racing scene to be quick and nimble. This one gives us a higher performance keel, but this time the rudder is on a skeg where it should be. Weighing about 9,000 pounds, she's the lightest of the bunch, but she was built for speed. This boat is a good example of the very bare minimum you'd want to look at for any sort of adventure like we're planning. If you're on an extremely tight budget and you could land this thing for say about seven grand, it would leave you a ton of money to get her ship shape, even if it means new sails and throwing a new engine at her. And the engine in her is 
kind of a downfall because she isn't a diesel like the last boat. She's actually an atomic four gas engine. So that's what many sailboats were back in this day. Um, and these can be great little engines if you're okay with doing the mechanical work from time to time. Bring extra parts like water pumps and impellers and you should be fine. They are easy to work on and every old salt sailor will know this engine inside and out. As a bare minimum boat, the Tartan 30 certainly could do the trip and would be a blast to sail down the coast because she's fast. As long as the decks aren't rotted on this boat, if you threw 10 grand at getting her ready, she would be an excellent cruiser for a solo sailor. Hey, while you guys are here, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Both of those things are free for you and would really mean the world to me. Next up, let's get a lot more coastal ocean worthy with a much heavier 12,000 pounds and a longer keel to keep you safe. This is an Endeavor 32 and judging by the pictures, someone's already tried to live on this one. It already has some framework at the back and a few solar panels on it, which would save you trouble later. They're asking $19.9 for this boat, and it is filthy, which is good. It really needs someone to spend a weekend on it, cleaning it and buffing some luster back into the gel coat. But again, that's good for us. Boats that are filthy don't show very well, and it gets a lot easier to talk the price down. You'll pay for that discount in sweat equity cleaning the boat later, but remember the budget is what matters here. The Endeavour was designed to be a smaller liveaboard cruiser, so we get things like a bigger galley right out of the box. We get lots of storage and cabinetry for our, our clothes, and a fridge freezer compartment, a rear quarter berth, and a head with an actual door. This boat also comes with an engine that would happily survive the trip. It's a Yanmar 2Q, so it's going to be easy to work on, easy to get parts for, and as long as you keep up on the oil changes and fuel filters, it'll likely never give you any issue at all. Before we start talking about how we'll be spending the other 10 to 15 grand of our budget after buying the boat, we need to look at one more boat and likely the best ballin' on a budget cruiser that you can get. These things are plentiful and can be found really everywhere. It's also the biggest boat on our list today. This is an Islander 36. So we get way more space inside than anything else we've looked at and a lot more weight to keep us safe and comfortable. A whole 14,000 pounds for this one. And that's right where we wanna be for a budget cruiser. Again, a freshwater boat, which is nice. She's also got a fairly high performance fin keel and the rudder is on a skeg where it should be. This boat looks to be in great shape on the underside and very dirty on the top side, which again, good for us. More ways to drive that price down from the $15,000 ask. Inside, we get a fairly common layout for a 36 footer and lots of room to make any changes we wanna make for our long-term comfort. I like converting the port side study into a day bed that takes up about half the main saloon so I can sleep comfortably in the middle of the boat on a near to queen size bed. This boat comes with that gas atomic four again, so I would want a compression test before I paid 15 grand for this boat and make a decision from there. If the engine is healthy, stock up on spare parts and use it. If it isn't, drive the price into the ground and replace it with a brand new Beta Marine diesel for about six grand and call it a day. The Islander 36 is fairly well known as a capable boat. It sails very well single-handed and they are for sale just about everywhere. You can find one. It's likely the cheapest 36 footer you're ever gonna find. And it does everything you need it to do to head out to the Bahamas in November safely. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make these videos possible. The mission at Lady K has always been to get more people sailing more easily. If you'd like to help out, please consider becoming a patron. So we've spent 15 grand and have 15 left, but we have a boat that we can somewhat be proud of and it's time to outfit her. How we're gonna go about doing that will heavily depend on how crafty you are, how mechanically inclined, how shrewd you are as an aftermarket used market shopper and a little bit of luck would help. First, we need to take care of any big ticket items that the boat needs to float and move around safely. Are the sails serviceable? If not, go and find some used sails that will fit. I like asking the local racers what they have hiding in their sail lofts or garages. 
Racers almost always have used sails laying around, and with the right amount of looking and befriending other sailors, you can get a great set of five-year-old sails for less than 1500 bucks. It's what I do for Lady K every few years when she needs sails. The rigging is going to be a big deal too, but because this boat is so cheap, we're likely not going to be bothering with full coverage hull insurance, so we won't have some pesky insurance company telling us we need new standing rigging every 12 years. If it's rusty, replace it. If it's not rusty, keep it from getting rusty and replace the clevis pins and other hardware if you need to. I love going to places like Bacon Sales in Annapolis and raiding their used hardware bins for new blocks and tackle. Finding used stuff is really easy if you start looking around, and most of this stuff was built to last, so there's really no reason to buy a brand new set of blocks. If you do find that you need to do brand new standing rigging, shop around as much as you can and do as much as you can yourself. Remove it from the boat, take it into a shop, don't make somebody come to the boat and remove it for you. Uh, bring them into the shop one at a time if you have to. The last big expense will be the engine. And while you will be sailing a lot, the engine will be a critical component and it can't be overlooked. If you're so inclined, do a compression test before you buy the boat so you know what you're getting into. And make sure you drive the price down as much as possible if a new engine is in the cards. Do a full service on the engine and buy as many spare parts as you can before you leave. I like to take the oil and fuel filters to Napa or your local car parts store and have them run the model number of the filters through their system. Most times there's a Napa or store brand of the same filter and then you can buy them much cheaper and you can buy 10 of all your filters and keep them on board. The last thing to do with whatever money we have left is to outfit the boat. We need a solid compass and a solid depth sounder and hopefully the boat came with those things. But if not, you can shop around on the used market around your area and see what you can find. Don't buy a brand new compass. They're ridiculously, ridiculously expensive. Buy a used one that's still accurate and still calibrated. For depth, if you need to buy a whole new depth sounder, it's about 300 bucks for a really good one. Spend the money. You'll be happy you did. Ground tackle can be another big expense, but you'll need an anchor that's a bit too big for the boat so that you can sleep soundly. I like next generation anchors like Rockner or Mantis, but if all you can afford is a used anchor, grab a 33 pound Bruce and call it good. You'll probably get one for 40 bucks. Also buy used chain, about 100 feet of it, and back that up with 100 feet of nylon. For our budget, we should also be able to swing a used manual windlass to make retrieving the anchor easier. That's what I did. It's not a fancy electric windlass, but it's your morning exercise cranking back and forth to get the anchor up every day. Now that we know the boat can move, we know that it knows its depth because we bought a new depth sounder and it stops with a good anchor, it's time to worry about navigation and electricity. For navigation, pay for Navionics for the year and renew it every year. It's about 80 bucks and you're gonna have to do it. You're always gonna need that. Install a USB port at the helm and buy a pair of used iPads. I bought two used seven inch iPad minis because iPads never really go bad. They don't break down over time. They just age and when they're too old, they can't download apps anymore, so people sell them. They don't sell them because they're broken. Buy a couple seven inch iPad minis with the cellular option. You don't need a cellular plan or a SIM card. They just have to be the cellular version because that one has a built-in GPS chip. Most people selling used iPads don't even know it's the cellular version, which was more expensive. So ask them if it has a SIM card slot on the side. If it does, say no more and buy it. And don't worry about the storage size or battery life. Navionics is small, maps are small, and you're gonna have it plugged in anyway. For electricity storage, to keep it as cheap as possible, most bang for buck, go and buy four golf cart batteries, like Trojan T105s, something like that. That'll give you over 200 amp hours of usable energy, which is lots. This is gonna run you around a grand, but they last at least five years, and not worrying about power is pretty important. To charge those batteries, we need some sort of solar system. I built a solar frame over the cockpit, mostly did it myself, for about $500. I found inch and a half stainless tubing from a local guy, and I had it bent by a professional to make the main hoops, then support it with extra stainless tubing to make it all strong. The fittings are expensive, but all in, $500 should do it. Slap two solar panels on the top to finish it off. 
When I was buying my solar panels, I shopped around and I ended up calling a local company that does the big solar installs I see on the farms around here on the trackers. And I asked them if I could buy two panels that they use, but I would pay cash. And they were all too happy to sell me a pair of 275 watt panels for $500. That's less than a dollar a watt. And I came out of it with a pair of very high end panels and 550 watts of solar. Then pick up a Victron charge controller for a few hundred dollars and a good battery monitor like the one Victron sells and your electrical system will be complete. You can decide if you want a fridge or not, I'd get one, but I'd suggest going the cheaper route and getting a Dometic chest fridge and pick up a 2000 watt pure sign inverter from Amazon and you'll be happy that you have it. Now there are obviously many other expenses that you need to think about, life jackets, water cans, diesel cans, a dinghy, but if you're willing to do a lot of the work, shop around and get creative, you seriously can be living in the Bahamas this coming winter and every winter thereafter for less than 30 grand. And all in with Starlink, you could even work from the boat if you needed to, so you could keep making the boat better over time. I hope this video helped you guys and I will see you next week. Until then, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. We'll see you.